Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this will be the fourth episode uh, on a character study. The character we're studying now is Abraham. So if you haven't seen the previous episodes, uh, they are already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so uh, you can go back and watch those there. Uh, I'm going to pick up today with Genesis 1.28. That's where we left off last time. So I'll read these verses. I'm basically just reading every verse that has Abraham's name in it and then discussing it, seeing what I can learn about Abraham. Genesis 1.21.8 says, And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm what Brother Joe Byron uh, coined as a King James firstist. So I like to look at the King James Version, version first. And then I, uh, if it's not real obvious, the meaning, uh, maybe if I can gain some other understanding, I'll, I'll look at some other translations or uh, commentaries, Greek or wh whatever will help me better understand it. Uh, and for this study, I th I'm looking at King James and then I'm looking at the Amplified version because the Amplified is, is like a translation and a commentary all mixed together. So let me see what the Amplified says here about this verse. verse Genesis 21, 8. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Well, there's really no difference or elaboration because it's really quite obvious. Uh, the child is Isaac. Uh, this is the child that uh, uh, Abraham and Sarah were promised by God. And to briefly recap what's happened is that they promised the child from Abraham and Sarah for for many, many years. Uh, several times God repeated the promise. And as Abraham and Sarah got older and older and, and Sarah became too old to bear a child and was barren, uh, Sarah convinced Abraham to, uh, she didn't have faith that God was going to keep that promise and that she could bear a child. So she convinced Abraham to have a child with her handmaiden, her servant, Hagar, who was an Egyptian woman. So Abraham, of course, this great man of faith, uh, I think this demonstrated his lack of faith at that point too, that uh, uh, he agreed. And he, uh, he went with a handmaiden. They had a son named Ishmael. Uh, and then years later, the promise was repeated and Abraham and Sarah laughed and they laughed at God's make, continuing to make this promise. And, and uh, they eventually God did keep his promise. And at an old age, when uh, uh, Sarah was, I think, 83 years old uh, or 90 years old, I can't recall. She was 90 years old and she bare a child. Now, obviously, uh, <laughs> women don't bear children at that age. So this was a, another a miraculous conception uh, and the child is Isaac so we see that Isaac and Ishmael are half brothers Abraham is the father of both and then the mother is uh, Isaac is Sarah the mother of uh, Ishmael is Hagar the Egyptian woman and God promised both Ishmael and Isaac that, that you know great nations would come from them and sure enough we have the the uh, Israelites uh, come from uh, Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, from that line, family line, we get the Israelites. And then from uh, Ishmael's family line, uh, we get um, the, the problem in the Middle East we see today is that uh, the, these other people, which most of them are Muslims in the Middle East, uh, the, the uh, Arabians, and they are uh, the descendants of Ishmael. So you got a family feud going on for all these centuries uh, of these millennia between these half brothers. Now Ishmael was the older brother. He was 12 or 13 years older 
And it is normal for the older brother to be the one that gets the, the, the promises, the inheritance, uh, and he, the, the first, firstborn has this extra privilege, this extra status. Uh, but he was born uh, not according to God's plan, according to, to the will of Abraham and Sarah. So the promise didn't go to Abraham, I mean to uh, Ishmael, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as would be normal being the firstborn. Uh, but the Ishmael and all his descendants, all these people in the Middle East today, they disagree with that. They think that they're entitled to all the land because, because uh, yeah, Ishmael was the firstborn. And so that's, uh, that's how, why we have all these problems in the Middle East today. Um, you know, let's look at uh, Genesis uh, 21, 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. So I guess I've jumped ahead in the story a little bit, but uh, at this point, Sarah sees Hagar's uh, son, uh, that would be Ishmael, mocking. Uh, and uh, wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, Isaac. So, um, you know, not only, not only is it God's will that uh, the, this promise, uh, the, the promise of the seed that would be the, uh, the, the Savior that would come from Abraham, from the genealogy of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, Jesus. That's the family line that the prophecies say that uh, we will have this uh, promised Savior. And um, so now Sarah is uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, she's got her son and she's insisting that he receive the uh, uh the heir, he, he should be the heir, not share this with, with uh, Ishmael. And then in 2111 it says, and the time was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of the son. 2111, let me look at that in. Uh, 2111, then Amplified says, and the thing was very grievous that's serious evil in Abraham's sight on account of his son, Ishmael. So Sarah was really bothered by Ishmael being around. She complained to Abraham, and he was bothered by it too. He, she decided something had to be done. So 21.12 says, And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bond woman and all that Sarah hath said unto thee. Hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So, you know, as God originally promised that this seed would come through Abraham and Sarah, and he's uh, confirming it again here. Um, in Genesis 21, 14, it says, uh, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Well, we're studying Abraham, not Isaac or Ishmael right now. So I won't go into the following verses to talk about what happened in great detail, but it does seem when we first read this, it seems uh, maybe cold-hearted, you know, that uh, that Abraham and Sarah, and then God would agree that they should be cast out. Um, but it does, God does. Uh, talk to uh, Hagar and says that you know she, she and Ishmael were, will survive even though it's hard being out in the wilderness and that from Ishmael 
they will become you know great nations and sure enough that many of the middle eastern nations are all descendants of ishmael um, so in the um, uh, amplified 21 14 says so abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave them to hagar putting them on her shoulders and he sent her and the youth away and she wandered on aimlessly and lost her way in the wilderness of Beersheba. Hmm. Okay. Now, I told you without reading all the verses what happens with, uh, you know, Hagar and Ishmael. So continue looking at Abraham's life. And we skip up now to, to uh, Genesis 21, 22. And it came to pass that time, at it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, that's spelled P-H-I-C-H-O-L, I think it's, I think it might be pronounced Phicol. Uh, the chief captain of his host spake unto Abraham saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Okay, let's look at that in context here. Uh, that's uh, 21, let me see, that's 21, 22. 21, 22. So uh, 21 through 23, let's see what we can get from a little context. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief priest of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son. <laughs> but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. Hmm. So this is uh, uh, Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham. So they're, they're saying this to Abraham. I wonder why would they... Uh, ask uh, Abraham to not deal falsely with with them. Let's look at that in the Amplified. <clears throat> so now swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or my son or with my son or my posterity, but as I have dealt with you kindly, you will do the same with me and with the land in which you have sojourned. Well, um, it makes me wonder, um, is, um, is this being said to Abraham? Because everybody in that place and time at uh, a place in the world in that time in history, that it was just very, very common for people to be dishonest and scheme and cheat, cheat everybody. Is that why it was said to Abraham? Uh, or could it possibly be that Abraham had a reputation already as a liar? I mean, after all, he did, he did lie to the king year, many years earlier about uh, Sarah not being his wife. And uh, we, we recounted that problem, how, how that happened in a previous episode. So Abraham uh, seems to be uh, not completely honest, and uh, maybe he has a reputation for that. And so he's, he's asked by this, uh, these people, Abimelech 
and the, the FICO to, to treat them fairly and honestly because they've been very kind to him. Okay, so uh, 21, 24, uh, and Abram said, I won't swear. So he swore that he would be fair with him and be honest. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken. 21, 25. Let me see that in context. And Abimelech said, I will not, I, I wot not <laughs> who hath done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it, but today. I think I know what that means. I wot not, W-O-T. <laughs> Some of these old English words crack me up. I'm gonna look at that in the Amplified, see if it uh, helps me. Abimelech said, I know not who did this thing. Certainly it's a lot easier to understand that phrase. I know not who did this thing. You did not tell me, and I did not hear it of it until today. Okay. And Abraham uh, took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? Genesis 21, 29. Hmm. Let's look at that 2129. 2129. In uh, context here. Uh, and a biblical Abraham. Uh, what mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. All right, let's look at uh, 2133 in context here. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up, and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' lands many days. Okay, 33. All right, so now I'm gonna to go to, uh, let's go to uh, the 2134. Beyond that, it says, uh, now I begin in chapter 22, verse one. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, 
and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Okay, now we're getting into the nitty gritty with Abraham and Isaac. Um, Now, it's interesting here, he says, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Well, two things stand out to me from this saying. One is, was Isaac really Abraham's only son? Well, we know that he had Ishmael, but he was not a legitimate son. He was not a son through his wife, Sarah. He was a son through... Uh, the servant, Hagar. And he was not the promised son that God promised them. So God just doesn't even recognize the existence of Ishmael. He calls Isaac his only son. Now, what's going to happen with Abraham and Isaac is, is a picture of the future event of Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. And so here we get the first indication that uh, uh, this is talking about sacrificing an only son. We know that Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So here we have a picture of Jesus because Isaac is referred to as his only son who will be sacrificed. Uh, let me look at this in the uh, Amplified. See if it has any interesting insights. Ah, God said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Uh, and go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Offer his son as an offering, a sacrifice. God offered his son, Jesus Christ, as an offering, a sacrifice. Oh, somebody's here. Hey, Sam. Hi, Brother Luke. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you doing? Great, great. Uh, Brother Bill going to join us. Um, he's going to wait till his place is quiet down a little bit, so he'll, he'll be joining us momentarily. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know how much you've heard, but I'm on a really fantastic part of the scriptures about Abraham right now. Have you been listening at all? Oh, no. I just joined in. I, got just, I just got your link. I just joined in. Okay, well, right now we're at the point where God is telling Abraham to take his son up and offer him oh. as a burnt offering. So uh, let me give you the, the verses here. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the verse in KJV and then sometimes going to the Amplified to get a little better understanding of it. But this is what I've said so far here is right now we're on um, uh, Genesis 22. Verses 1 through 3 is what I'm reading. Okay. And, and so in KJV and Amplified, I'm looking at this, but here we see that he says, God said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. So this is a picture of God offering his only son, Jesus, whom he loves, uh, offering as a sacrifice. Right, right. All right. Um, mm -hmm. People there, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I've just begun to talk about that. What's your first response to Genesis twenty-two, verse uh, two? Well, you know, obviously God is testing his faith. Uh, God had uh, made that covenant with Abraham, and now he's testing Abraham whether uh, his faith is in his right place or not. And of course, um, Abraham uh, being faithful and also being heard of what God told him, and also believing in his promise, 
and surely he's following what God has told him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I've talked about this before in other uh, prior videos on Abraham about how Abraham is given this title as this uh, father of faith, uh, this great man of faith. In Hebrews, it talks about Abraham and some others as examples of men of faith. And, and yet, we know that Abraham and Sarah didn't show much faith when they decided that uh, they would take it upon themselves to have a child with Hagar because they didn't have faith that God was going to keep the promise since Sarah was already old and barren. So on one hand, we, we think of him as this great man of faith, but even Abraham, uh, we see that he and Sarah, you know, lost their faith as far as God keeping that promise. So he's a great man of faith, and now we're going to see how his faith is really demonstrated with this uh, sacrifice of Isaac. Right, right. I mean, it's very important to see why uh, he's, um, he's so faithful. Uh, I think I've, I've already laid out two reasons why. You know, firstly, he had that covenant uh, directly from, uh, from God. So he had that initial encounter with God uh, regarding that covenant. So, you know, um, you know, most of the people will say like, hey, you know, if God tells you to kill somebody, would you do it? You know, that sort of thing. And we know that God doesn't tempt anyone with evil. Um, so here, at, one could just kind of read, hey, that's, 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 not, that's not good. And you know, how could God do that? But if we consider what Abraham went through with God, with God, you know, what sort of covenant that he was promised and that he had that direct relationship with God, uh, you know, we know that the reason why he's taking up his son is that he heard directly from him. He had that experience uh, with God. So when he, when God told him, um, to sacrifice Isaac, you know, I think Abraham knew uh, what God was trying to do. Yeah. So that's well, probably one of the reasons why he was following through in this sort of act where he is taking his son to, to be sacrificed. Yeah. Well, you uh, said God does not tempt anyone with evil, and I think you're, you're, you're that is true. Uh, but when we read verse 1, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And then he told him to go and take his son to be sacrifice him. So it says that he did tempt Abraham. But right. how do you, how do you uh, explain that? Uh, basically, right. so basically, you know, God is tempting Abraham, uh, but... But what, what's the purpose? That's, that's what we need to look at. Is he tempting Abraham um, so that Abraham can fall away from God? Or is he you know, tempting Abraham to, uh, for, to build his faith or uh, for, for out of goodness? So there's two, different, two distinct differences uh, in tempting, where Satan may tempt you with evil, but God doesn't tempt anyone with evil. He, he does so. He tests people uh, to test you out of goodness so that your faith can grow stronger. Yeah. Now, um, I've ha heard a lot of people explain this and, and other, other examples like this, that uh, God tested Abraham, was testing his faith. But to me... That would indicate that God didn't was not omniscient; that He didn't know what was going to happen. He had to test him to find out if Abraham would would do what He told him to do or not. But we we know that God knows the future, so He didn't have to test Abraham so Abraham could prove himself to God. So if He doesn't, if it's not to prove himself to God, testing in that way, what is the real value? Because we know Isaac was ends up not being sacrificed. What is the real value of this whole thing that we're going to be reading about? What's the importance of it if 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 it's not to to find out if Abraham was faithful? 
I think the uh, the real value here, I think I kind of mentioned it, is to uh, for ultimate goodness, um, and and also for ultimate goodness, I, I'm also referring to the uh, what what what's to come. Uh, in this case, Jesus Christ, and for His faith, uh, for Abraham's faith, um, you know, as we walk our faith in life, uh, you know, there are many tests and temptations. As we go through them, you know, our faith uh, can be stronger that man that much and grow in Christ uh, a little more uh, towards goodness. Uh, James one thirteen says. Let no man say, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempt, cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. So he's not tempting, he's not tempting any man with evil or evil intention or purpose. Uh, that 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 would be Satan's job, so to say. So the same thing here is going on with uh, with Abraham. God is tempting Abraham uh, for for the purpose of the ultimate goodness, whether that that whether, whether that would be to develop his faith, Abraham's faith, or and or uh, whether to uh, for that ultimate goodness, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so you agree with me that it, God is not testing his faith. Because God wants to see what would happen. So we know that God already knows the beginning from the end. Right, right. Exactly. So, so uh, uh, I do think that uh, Abraham's faith being demonstrated, not only will, um, and, and then God ending up in the end of the story here, not stopping Abraham uh, from the sacrifice, um, but Abraham was fully willing to do it through faith. So that certainly would help Abraham knowing that he, he'll have faith and God will do the right thing. He can trust God. But I think more than anything, this whole thing was done for Brother Sam and Brother Luke and Brother Bill and everybody else who, who ever reads about this account. This is a historical event account. It's a real event in, in history. And uh, we're still talking about it. It's much like the story of Job. Why would God allow all these things to happen about Job? To Job, it seems unkind and you know unfair, and 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 good, yet God permitted it. Well, I think the reason for all these accounts are so that we can talk about it today and learn about God's uh, faithfulness, uh, the faith of these of Abraham and jo and, and Job as examples for us to have more faith. Uh, and of course, uh, I did a long series called, um, I titled it, I retitled it recently called The Bloody Trail. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a record from Genesis all the way through the scriptures of, of all the accounts of the, that were commonly called pictures and shadows of Jesus' blood atonement. Uh, where this is, this is a perfect example, as we discussed this, we'll see that this is an, a picture of this future sacrifice. It says in this verse here that uh, uh, Jesus, uh, that he says, uh, take now thy son, thy only son. And yet we know that he had Ishmael, but he was an illegitimate son. He was not the promised son that God intended. Uh, so he discounts and dismisses and ignores the fact that Ishmael even exists. And so he refers to Isaac as his only son, whom thou lovest. So we see Isaac as being, and we can compare him to Jesus being the only son which his father loves, and then right. but willing to willing to offer as a sacrifice. Right. Yeah. I think I don't know. I may be wrong, but uh, Abraham kind of knew, in a way, what God is God was doing. Um, because the reason why I say this is that if you haven't heard from God. Uh, before in, in, in prior, you know, if you hear just kind of out of blue, hey, you know, get your son and you know, sacrifice it, you know, like what you doubt about it, you know. But the fact that he heard from him, he knows his voice, he knows 
that, oh, you know what? I think I've been, I'm being tested in a way. So I don't know. Uh, that I may be wrong, but I think Abraham pr had pretty much good idea what God was trying to do because he had an initial experience with God. He knew his voice. That, uh, that brings up like three questions that I intended to ask you next. And that is, uh, how, how are we to take this whole encounter in terms of how Abraham saw this playing out? Did Abraham know from the beginning that, oh, God's just testing him and he's not going to really have me sacrifice my son? That would be option one. Or that uh, option two, that he's, uh, he, he's, uh, he is going to have me sacrifice my son. Or option three is, yeah, he is going to uh, sacrifice, have me sacrifice my son, but he'll bring him back to life because otherwise, and, you know, this is the son he promised that we're going to have many nations and, the, and this uh, promise is coming through my son Isaac. So right. these are the three possibilities that I think that Abraham could have thought how, as he was thinking about it. Right, right. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think uh, verse 8 kind of gives kind of gives it away when Isaac asks, behold the fire and the wood where is the land for a bun offering and Abraham said my son God will provide himself a land for a bun offering so they went both on together so it that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm, I'm I'm presuming in a way that Abraham knew that uh, God was tasking him and that if if it is, you know, if it is in fact that God wants, send, you know, wants him to sacrifice his son, he will do it anyway. But he has a faith now, uh, here, as it, as in the verse eight says, "My son, God will provide Himself a land for a burnt offering." To him, it, you know, he probably meant that, "Hey, you are uh, a burnt offering." But to Isaac, that, "Oh, okay, there will be, there will be a lamb somewhere." Up, yeah. in the, up, up in the mountain. So, yeah. well, you're. Uh, um, there's a lot I want to say about that verse when we get to it, but um, you, you're you're thinking that God, uh, that Abraham knew that God would provide this lamb, and and, and that, uh, or, or but I think a lot of people would say, uh, no, he didn't know, but he was telling Isaac that. So that Isaac would cooperate and be calm and not be all afraid. And, and uh, after all, we know that Abraham was a liar. He, he, he would justify lying and if he felt you know, the ends justify the means. He lied that Sarah was his wife because he thought it would uh, you know, uh, keep him alive. Uh, and so uh, that's another, that's the more common way that I've heard people think, well, no, Abraham told his son that because he needed to keep his son relaxed. If he told his son he was going to take him up and sacrifice him, him at that point in time, his son might be like afraid or, or who knows what would happen. But uh, we're going to get, uh, there's something else I want to talk about verse 8 when we get there. Okay, but let's let's go now back to verse. Uh, yeah, just, uh, um, just kind of to add on that. Um, yeah, he, you know, like, it doesn't have to be either all. All I, I think it's both in a way that uh, you know, like we you've got to imagine how he was like how his pro his heart probably would be breaking at this point when he when he said to his son. But uh, I think it's not either or, but it's it's both that you know he wanted to con con concert he wanted to comfort and and make his son you know calm down or what have you. But in a, in a way, he also had that faith. I think it works both ways. Yeah, that's true. It, 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 I think both of those could have been in, uh, factors at the same time. Um, so verse 3, uh, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Uh, there's nothing we need to say about that. Is there anything stand out to you in there? Um, all the morning, there's something, you know, he rose up, all, he, didn't, he didn't tarry, you know, he was like, oh man, how am I going to do this? You know, he's, he was not keep putting off things, but he, you know, he rose up all in the morning, just right away, 
you know, get ready, told, uh, uh, you know, you know, took his servants uh, and got everything ready, you know, and they headed to the yeah. place where the guy told them, you know. So it was well, like he, he, I like, can see three things. I can see three things in this verse. If uh, I'm not sure, this might be a stretch uh, on a couple of these things, but okay. I think your point about rising up early in the morning is he is a good point. He didn't procrastinate, put it off. He he obeyed and he did it immediately, uh, and right. then and saddled his ass. So here we have an ass, which is a donkey, and we know Jesus was. Uh, supposed to ride a donkey into Jerusalem and, as uh, as the Messiah, and he took yeah, two. Yeah. And exactly. Took, yeah, it took two of his young men with him. So we see the, uh, Isaac uh, is Abraham's son, and he has two other men with him, which we know Jesus is the Son of God, and he was crucified with two other men with him. Right. And, and clave the wood of the burnt offering. Uh, the wood, you know, Isaac will be laid down upon this wood, and Jesus would lay down on a wooden cross. Uh, yep, exactly. Uh, right. So there's a lot in there. I think the uh, the part, particularly the part about the wood, when we get to that, that's a real good picture of uh, Jesus being on the cross. Right, right, exactly. And also when, uh, you know, like the the, the travel, and also the uh, travel on the uh, on on the ass, for example, on the donkey, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like uh, like how Christ went to Jerusalem, you know, on a, on a, on an ass. <laughs> he, he rode an ass to to Jerusalem. Uh, it's quite symbolic here too. Mm -hmm. Then on verse four, and then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Anything in that verse there? Um, interesting. On the third day, you know, on the third day. So. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> okay. so, all these are quite symbolic of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know? And also, some people say that this tra uh, trail that you, they went through uh, is actually that hill that um, you know Christ carried his cross. So, mm -hmm. yeah. the same place he got he got you know sacrificed, and now he got uh, he got uh, he got uh, he was on the cross, the same place that Isaac laid upon. So I I don't know whether that's true or not, but I, that's quite interesting if it is so. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think I possibly heard that. So uh, you're saying then that this particular location is is right where Jerusalem was. Would, would later become just for Jerusalem? Um, a Golgotha, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, this was not, uh, let me see, what up early morning. He had to go to, uh, uh, to the, into the land of Moriah. The land of Moriah. Uh, I'm not sure where the land of Moriah is, if that's, if that's the same area as uh, where Jerusalem was or not. But, uh, I think I've heard that said before too, but I don't know if I'm confident in saying it. Uh, verse five, and Abraham said unto his young son, young men, abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Um, so, um, you know, he is telling, he is telling these men that he and, his son will come back to him. Uh, so you could take the point of view that you're, you said earlier that he knows all along and that uh, uh, Isaac is not going to really be sacrificed or that he will be resurrected or something. That he's, he's confident that he's going to be coming back with Isaac. Or he could be just telling his men that because he doesn't want to alarm his men or alarm uh, Isaac at this point. Yeah, and I think I, I'm more inclined towards uh, Abraham knew that God was testing him in a way because he did say that I and the lad will come back to you. You know, he didn't say that I'm going to go there. <laughs> I myself will come back. He didn't say that. Uh, Surely he said to those two men, just like to just like those two thieves on the cross next to uh, to Christ, 
he told them that, you know, I'll be back. <laughs> we'll be back, you know. Uh, probably one of the one of the men, one of the two men probably didn't believe in. He, they probably were, I mean, if I were to make some kind of fictitious story, what was going on, then those two guys will be saying, hey, you know what, he's going to kill his son. And the other guys, no, no, no. <laughs> no I don't think so. How dare you? Blah, blah, blah. You know, just like how those two thieves had the, the conversation. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. <laughs> yeah, that would be... Uh... That'd be interesting to hear what what they were saying if they had any suspicion about what was going on. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Yeah, what are we on? Verse uh, verse six. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. So he laid this wood upon Isaac his son. Well, you know, uh, can you imagine how how he must have felt? You know, like oh, you know, I heard I heard your the same voice from you. I heard the the covenant, and I heard your voice. You know, you know, telling me to take my son for sacrifice, and he's and he has a knife in his hand. You know, I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, what a thousand thoughts probably went through his head. Yeah. Or he probably just like you know at that I don't I, you know this that's one of the reasons why he is the father of faith I mean you know this is amazing you know yeah I wonder what this says I'm gonna look it up in uh, amplified here but when it says um, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son uh, that's like the cross being laid upon Jesus's back he had to carry that cross and Isaac is carrying this wood I imagine if he laid it upon Isaac he didn't put it in his arms he probably put it on his back and you know, had right. it, you know over your back so mm -hmm. Isaac carrying this wood up to to be to, to for his death as right. Jesus carried that cross up to his death exactly you know here uh, in verse 5 we, we read you know abide e me e meaning uh, two men here with the s right so just there just just abraham and isaac and and along the along all this time the ass was carrying the wood upon uh, the uh the, the wood of the bar offering now isaac is 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 carrying that but yeah so obviously that's quite symbolic of how uh, and and also very an analogical and comparative to you know Christ carrying the cross yeah I'm looking at the amplified uh, version of verse 6 and it confirms what we've been saying here it says then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac his son right Right, laid it upon Isaac, his son. I mean, yeah. Amplify, KJV, both are same to me. For me, KJV is easier for me. I don't know, maybe being me being foreigner <laughs> or not English speaker. They're both the same, but, but KJV flows better with me somehow. <laughs> yeah, I think that when it says uh, laid it upon him, uh, that's what I was saying. Is, right, right. How can you lay wood upon someone? The only way to lay it upon them and have them carry it is to put it over their shoulders, their back, you know, like that. Right. Yeah. So now it says, uh, back to KJV, verse 7, And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, am I, son. Uh, and he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Uh here am I, son. Uh, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, even Isaac at this time, I don't think he was that innocent. I think Isaac kind of knew as well. Uh, and that's one of the reasons probably why he asked to clarify, you know, hey, you know, I'm carrying this, there's no, no lamb, uh, but what does that mean that I'm going to be the sacrifice kind of thing? <laughs> so, so I think that's, um, 
he, he sensed at least. And he, he if he's old enough to carry all that wood, uh, you know, he's he's probably at the age, probably teenage or even uh, even older. So he is you know, above beyond uh, the you know age age of reason. So he's he's reasoning himself obviously here, you know. Even Christ, you know, when he was said, uh, you know, Father, why have you forsaken me? I and mean, he had said that to fulfill the the prophecy and the, and the scripture. Uh, and I'm sure that Christ even had a little bit of like, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> kind of wondering, you know. Yeah. You know? Well, uh, I... Th- I can't prove it right now, but I, I believe uh, it's, it's uh, taught that um, Ab- uh, Isaac was uh, 12 years old at this time. So mm. yeah, he's certainly old enough to put two and two together. But for him to think that he was going to be sacrificed, I'm not sure that that makes sense. Because, see, uh, human sacrifice was not practiced by right. people. They did sacrifice animals, but they didn't sacrifice people. So right. this would have been totally foreign to to Abraham or, or Isaac, and so but he but he is wondering well why don't we have uh, a, a lamb I mean how can we get us to do a sacrifice without a lamb that's, right. that's a log- logical question you've got everything except the lamb so he's wondering but at this point he might be suspicious but I, I kind of doubt it because why would you think your father is going to sacrifice you I mean. I'm sure he didn't think his his father would do that to him, and and two, uh, human sacrifices weren't even practiced by them. So I, I don't I, I doubt he'd be. Well, there, are, there are two things. Um, well, human sacrifice uh, were practiced even during his time, but not by Abraham. I'm sure Isaac heard of that such uh, such tradition of uh, that sort of human sacrifice, but what. Abraham's sacrifice was lamb. So Isaac knew that when you sacrifice, you don't do human, you do lamb. He knew that. And he probably heard that uh, evil tradition of human sacrificing human. So probably uh, that's one of the reasons why he may be wondering. Uh, you know, so it, it's not, it's not, it was not practiced by Abraham, but, uh, but, but by other cultures and other, other people. But uh, Isaac, Isaac surely knew that when you sacrifice, you, you do it with the lamb. <laughs> so that's probably why he was asking. Yeah. So Abraham answers him and says in verse uh, 8, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Uh, all right, I'm going to give you first chance at this one. But I, I've got some in, some ideas on this that I, I think are really significant. But what what do you ta- your take of verse eight? Well, I, we we talked about it earlier. Um, you know, Abraham was trying to maybe uh, uh, com- comfort uh, his son. Uh, maybe his son, you know, his son is questioning, so he wanted to uh, comfort him, make sure that uh, that. You know, he uh, he stayed in his own faith, so to say, and at the same time, he's reassuring himself that this what I what he heard from God is not some kind of strange voice in his head, but directly from God, and have that deep faith that God will provide uh, the lamb for both of them. So. It, it, it kind of works in a both ways, not either one, but uh, it, it, it both it plays into both. Yeah, what, what I what I see in verse eight uh, to me is just it just really blows me away. And that uh, first of all, it says God will provide Himself a, a, a lamb for a burnt offering. So here we have a picture that uh, God provides the sacrifice, and that's right. you know, God provided the sacrifice of His Son. Yeah, right. Good point. Right. Now, uh, the other thing is when it, now this is significant because I don't think this is written in the same way in um, some of the modern translations. But in KJV, it says God will provide Himself a lamb. 
I think that, that we could take that as God could provide himself as a lamb. In other words, God's providing himself as the sacrifice. Right, right. I mean, the, himself didn't have to be in there unless God is the one doing it, you know. Yeah. So, you know, Abraham could have just told him, God will provide a land for us, <laughs> you know. He could just simply say that. But the, he kind of kind of is, is making double emphasis here. God will provide himself a land. That's, that's an excellent point, actually. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I just read that in the, in the uh, uh, boy, I read that in the Amplified just then. Let me look at the KJV, because Amplified does say it uh, correctly. I know the NIV or something, it, 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 let me look at it in NIV for a minute here, because I think this is a good argument against NIV, even though I'm, I'm willing to look at all these modern translations. Sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're horrible. Okay, let me look at NIV on that verse and see what it says. Eight, uh, God himself will provide the lamb. See, that doesn't tell me the same thing. God will provide him, God himself will provide the lamb. Okay, that's that's not near as significant to me as God will provide himself a lamb. Uh, so uh, let's look at it in uh, KJV and see what that says. Uh, Uh, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Yeah, so to me that is an important uh, a difference. The way it's phrased in the KJV and the Amplified agrees with it. It's exactly the same in the Amplified. God will provide himself a lamb. So I see that he's, we, we learn two things. God will provide the sacrifice. It's not up to us to do it. And then also that the sacrifice, this lamb, will be himself. He will be the sacrifice. All right. Uh, we'll, want to go to verse 9 now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. <laughs> God. Now, I mean, as soon as, as Isaac's being laid upon it and bound, <coughs> oh God, <coughs> there is no more question. <coughs> it becomes very clear to Isaac at this point, I guess, huh? Right. I mean, even Isaac, he's not saying anything at this point. You know, it's like, hey, you know, I, I thought you told me that God will provide more life. You know, you know why am I being bounded? You know, you know he's, he's silent. He's just silent. Well, the, there's a verse uh, talking about, uh, uh, I think, in, in Isaiah, or it's either Isaiah 53 or Psalm 22. It talks about he uh, um, he opened not his mouth. Right. And so uh, Jesus did not open up his mouth to to try to uh, you know defend himself or get out of it. He he just you know, accepted it, and right. Isaac is not saying a word right here. He didn't, yeah. I, there's not one record of him saying one word in, of protest or or questioning his father. <clears throat> and so he lays him upon the wood, uh, and he's bound. And of course, being bound is, would be like being nailed. You know, he's, he can't move once he's bound. He's, he's stuck there. Right. Uh, and, ten, as, and, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So there's, people can speculate what would have happened next. Uh, that, oh, he wouldn't have done it, or, or that uh, if he did it, maybe he believed that. Abraham, if he, was, if he was willing to sacrifice his son, which I do believe, then Abraham would have to either be thinking that, okay, God's killing my son, I'm going to do it. Or, or, or he'd have to be thinking that God's having me kill my son, but he'll bring him back to life. Because, you know, resurrection um, had happened in the past. Uh, uh, or was Elisha, I know Elisha re resurrected someone. Is it, was that uh, Elisha? No, that's coming later, much later. So is, there, is there any record of any resurrections before, before this uh, scene here? Mm. 
I don't know. I, not that I'm, I'm more aware of. I don't think so because we've got. Uh, uh, I mean, there, he's uh, Paul and uh, uh, and I think one of I think Peter. They have um, they have done so, but I don't know about in Old Testament. Yeah, well, we know that uh, Jesus resurrected, Peter resurrected, and I, I can't remember if Paul did or not. But in the Old Testament, I know Elisha did. Uh, I'm not sure if Elijah did, but so uh, it, it had been done. But Elisha doesn't happen. That's in the prophets. We're all we're still in Genesis right now. Right, so, right. Uh, there is no uh, historical record in the scriptures of any being being resurrected before this. So I'm not sure that Isaac would or Abraham would be even thinking that. Well, God will just resurrect him. Uh, I don't know if that's a uh, logical assumption there. Uh, so no, I, I don't think so. I mean, this is all. This is based upon his faith. It's, it, all these actions uh, are based upon the faith of Abraham. You know, even to the point that he, you know, he drew his knife to slay his son. So yeah. it's just about faith. It's nothing about like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> you know, uh, God will resurrect his son. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. And if we're going to believe the scriptures, what it says in verse 10, and you know, I, I, I believe the scriptures, but I, uh, you know, this is saying that, and, and took the knife to slay his son. And if he just said, drew back the knife, then, then we could speculate and say, well, maybe he, he wouldn't have actually done it. Because, but, but here it says, he drew back it to slay his son. So that was his intention. He was willing to do it. Right. It's, 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 it's describing his what he's doing in detail. I mean, Isaac is not saying anything. Uh, Abraham stretched forth his hand, probably towards his knife, and took the knife to slay his son. He's, he's taking the knife. And what's the intention? Not to cut the rope, but to slay his son. You know, yeah. so this yeah. demonstration of his faith. Uh, now, verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now, a lot of interesting things here. Uh, remember, uh, we talked a few weeks ago about this idea of the angel of the Lord and Christophanes and Theophanes and, and Bill introduced the idea of a triophany. Remember that? Right. right. Yeah. Well, here, here we have again, an example of the term, the angel of the Lord. Right. And, and when we get down into verse 12, it, if you read it all, uh, at the very end of it, it says, Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, uh, thy only son, from me. Mm -hmm. So this angel of the Lord is saying, speaking, and then he says, You haven't withheld him from me. And so right. I think you have to conclude that this angel of the Lord here is God speaking to him. Or like, um, or like a messenger or megaphone. You know how like God could, you know, we are using megaphone <laughs> you know to message to certain people to reach others uh, you know farther people uh, who are away you yeah. know it's like a tool so God is speaking through uh, the angel of the Lord of course and whether that's uh, Christophany or not I, I don't really question because I know for sure uh, that it is a fact that this angel of the Lord, whether that's a representation of God or not, is actually speaking the word of God. He's speaking, you know, so so I see that as more like a, a tool that God is using to speak through uh, and speak to uh, Abraham. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, uh, he he stops him. And he says, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, 
thine only son from me. Uh, so uh, I, I can see what you're saying, that it could be like uh, uh, using the angel to speak for God, uh, or it could very easily be that this term angel of the Lord, as we're going to discuss, uh, that'll be a, to me a, a fantastic study that I'm looking forward to looking at the term angel of the Lord and, and see that if this can is, is sometimes or always used as a reference to an appearance of God. But uh, here he says, I know that thou fearest God for now. I know that thou fearest God, but this doesn't seem to agree with my statement earlier which i think is is irrefutable and that is that god knows the future so uh god can't be surprised i mean he he knows what abraham was going to do or not going to do it's it's not like it's a test where i don't know if abraham would actually sacrifice his son let me test him out and see <laughs> you know right i think he was uh, i was i think he was speaking in uh, in a humanly tom meaning that in human we are bound, restricted in time. But for God, you know, whether that's past, present, or future, for God, it's now. Mm -hmm. You know, whether the time for us is, is like once we pass it, you know, now is now, past is past, you know, future is future. So we are kind of restricted. You know, we are kind of bound in that linear time but when god is looking at it you know it's like hey now i know uh it doesn't mean that i, I didn't know that before but now i know uh, but rather he knew before but to conform in humanly tom that now you are you are approved in a way <laughs> now you're showing your faith in, in that sense uh -huh. yeah that's a uh that makes sense, and uh, it makes sense as much as it can to me, because you know I think I'm a fairly intelligent person, but I cannot begin to understand time. It just it boggles my mind thinking of the concept of time, and and particularly how God, how to explain God when you know we we know that time can can only exist with uh, with a it's it's a measuring of of, of, of past, present, and future is, is a line, and yet God um, is eternal. Right. And how could God not have a beginning? And these, these things, you know, uh, I accept them and knowing that my mind can't comprehend so much, and it never will uh, <laughs> comprehend so you know, like If you look at um, a glass of water, you know, and, and I consider that, if you can consider that as time in essence, you know, this, this, as it is, that now that is. But within uh, the glass, the, all that water po uh, part, uh, particles, you know, one particle to the other particle, it has time. You know, it, it needs time to travel to one direction to the other. But as, a, as, a, as the glass in whole, as a whole, it's just there. It's now there. Already happened, already been going on, already been happening. <clears throat> so... And I, I don't know if I'm making uh, the analogy correctly, but uh, I, I think we can understand the concept of time better that way and how see, how God sees the time and how we see the time. It's because we are so in that time, <laughs> we don't really know the time as a whole. So, yeah, I mean, I can understand where you're coming from, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll say a saying that just came to my mind. It's it's not really even relevant to the subject at all. But um, uh, yesterday is history, tomorrow is mystery, today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Right. So I've always liked that saying. But uh, to me, that's that is the case. That uh, well, we can just think about the present. That's where we are. We can't change the past. The future gradually gets, uh, you know, revealed to us. We do know that we have promises uh, from God, and 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 God doesn't lie. So I I, I have confidence in, in His promises. But uh, yeah, well, the water example in the glass is helpful, but still, I'm I still my mind gets boggled and twisted like a pretzel. Uh, understand? Because like you know, 
I mean, according to God, you know, what's future for us already happened, already been happening, and it's already there. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, let's go to... Uh, uh, 13. Uh, yeah, verse 13. So, uh, he didn't... Uh, the, the angel of the Lord stopped him from sacrificing Isaac. And in verse 13, it says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. This, this whole verse is so rich. It just, it's just wonderful. I just like, to me, this is like, like the, the best, richest chocolate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, so sweet. Uh, all right, let me, let me get your reaction to verse 13 before I try to put in my two cents. All right. Um, well, I just looked up what ram me meant in the, uh, in the dictionary. It says uncastrated male sheep. All right. And um, basically, I mean, what an epic moment here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what an epic moment. <laughs> I mean, he's like, he lifted his eyes. That means he was looking at his son to slay him, right? Uh -huh. but because of this um, uh, angel of the Lord, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And I'm like, hey, there's the sheep. You know? <laughs> uh -huh. So I'm like, I mean, how could, how would, I wonder how, what he felt and how, how he felt about all this. You know, he's like, hey, I told you, son, kind of from that sort of feeling <laughs> to, 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 the, to the point like, oh, my God, thank you. Yes. And to the point like, how, this, how could this happen? And also, ultimately, guess what? His faith is like notched up. His faith boosts up like by 1,000% right here. Yeah, you know. So, wow, what an epic moment here. Uh, I I wonder uh, as we go continue studying Abraham. I mean, it's probably take us quite a while to get through the full study of Abraham. This is the fourth, the fourth study, and um, I wonder if, if we're going to ever see any lack of faith in him in the future. I don't remember if he does, but it seems like now he should never ever have another doubt. I mean, just really right. nothing but absolute faith. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, the idea what, of a what, else, what more do you need? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So uh, I like what you said about the ram. I wondered what I used to wonder why a ram instead of a lamb or a sheep. You know, because we know he's called the Lamb of God, and lambs were sacrificed. But in this case, it's a ram, and uh, as you said, a ram is is an adult male, and Jesus was an adult male. He wasn't a child like a little lamb. He was a, an adult. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And now here's the part that blows me away. A ram caught in a thicket by his horns. To me, that's a picture of the thorny crown. Mm -hmm. the oh, ram, that's a good point. That's an interesting point. Um, you know, the point is that uh, the, the lamb is not going anywhere. <laughs> You know, it's not like, um, you know, oh, there's a lamb, let's hunt, hunt that down. <laughs> oh, where's, where's, your, where's your arrow and where's your ball? You yeah. know, it's not like, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not catching them. He got caught by himself uh -huh. on his horn because he was uncastrated. <laughs> you know, in other words, it's kind of, it, it's kind of, it, was, it was wild. Uh, you know, it was, it, it was not raised by man. Mm -hmm. It's basically offered by God. You know? Yeah. Now, this ram could have had his foot uh, stuck in a rock and trapped in a little crack between the rocks or something, but instead, right, right. he's trapped by his head being in a thicket. And, right. and it's horns. And horns, the, the horns are like, sounds like thorns. And thicket, of course, you know, a thicket, uh, uh, it's, let me see what this says in, uh, uh, the Amplified, I'd be very curious on that, this particular verse. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. Uh, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So there's no elaboration there, no speculation. It's just saying what uh, the uh, KJV says. But to me, it is uh, significant that his horns are caught in this thicket, which to me uh, is really uh, a, a, another visual, another picture, shadow of the, the uh, Jesus head caught in this thicket with this thorny, thorny crown. Uh, and then we get to, uh, um, let me see what verse are we are on. I'm back to KJV now. Um, uh, and offered him up a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And in the stead of his son, of course, uh, it, Jesus is offered instead of us. So, uh, yeah, this verse is just beautiful. This whole chapter is just an amazing uh, picture of this future sacrifice that we, we rely upon and believe in for our salvation. Right. Um, verse 14, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. Jehovah-Jireh. Do you know what that means? I, I've heard that a lot of times like people in church uh, singing it, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh. Well, um, usually when it comes for the first time, it, it does define it for you. So uh, you got to read what it says here. Uh, as he said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen so that's what it means the mount of the Lord it shall be seen so where 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 God has been has 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 been seen that's I think that's what it means it shall be seen okay huh okay uh, verse 15 and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said by myself have I sworn, said the Lord, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the sea uh, shore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Uh, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Uh, let me, okay, so uh, starting with verse uh, 15. Go ahead and give me your idea, viewpoint on that. Well, you know, uh, I think also, again, it, you know, God is basically telling Abraham, you know, all right, in humanly time, of course, that, uh, hey, I've seen that, you know, what you do, uh, you know what, from now on, <laughs> you are made, <laughs> basically, you yeah. know. Uh, I mean, as you said earlier, uh, there is no, there was no testing from God uh, or tempting against or for Abraham. I mean, we could say here, you know, Abraham's faith reached, uh, reached the ultimate, the ultimate faith, you know, uh, any man can possess. So, I mean, even here, uh, the, uh, the angel of the Lord confirms and by myself and I, and by myself have I sworn, said the Lord, that's that's the Lord saying, you know, right? Uh -huh. For because thou has done this thing, and so that's that's actually he's he's praising his action, his act, his good work, has done this thing, and thou and has not revealed thy son, thine only son, you know, that in blessing I'll bless thee, and in multiplying I'll multiply. He's re reconfirming the covenant, mm -hmm. you know. So, wow, 
And I think that's one of the reasons why, as a as a reader at this time, living in, in the time, uh, living um, my time, so to say, we can see what sort of faith that Abraham had, and what sort of covenant that that the uh, that God made with him. Um, so, I mean, without this story, it, you know, that covenant. I don't think would have, would have kept, would have been kept, you know, with that sort of without this sort of experience, uh, without without this sort of test from God, I don't I don't think I I I know, I, I, may, I may be presuming, but Abraham might have um, doubted his faith all throughout his life, but because of this incident, because of this experience, you know, <laughs> he's made basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think this is another example of what we said earlier when we see that's the term, the angel of the Lord. In verse 15, mm -hmm. the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. So uh, if it's used like a megaphone the way you, you said it's a possibility, and that, that, that may be the case. But I, I, I lean towards it's the idea that this angel of the Lord is just a title for God in, this, in these cases. And it's God. Yeah, sure. I, mean, you know, I, I don't really ponder on that as long as I know that um, that, that is of God, you know. And, and that is of God and is God, speaking, uh, speaking as God. Um, so that's basically from God. So. Yeah. You know, you know the uh, the who, whoever's watching this video now and in the future, uh, if you are amazed by this uh, this chapter, as as I'm amazed by it, and it, to me it's just a, a, one of the greatest chapters in the scriptures, showing us a um, an ancient event. That, that was a perfect illustration and picture of a future event that is the most important event of history, and that is Je God giving his son Jesus to be a sacrifice for our sins. This is a perfect illustration of that, uh, you know, centuries before, and it's, uh, um, it's, it's what's called a picture or shadow in, in, in uh, theology terms. But I have a playlist called the bloody trail, and this uh, I've discussed this before and that, but but this is one example of dozens and dozens of examples throughout the scriptures of the same kind of a thing. Over and over again, we see these pictures, uh, Old Testament events, and we see how it's a picture of this future event, the the most important event that, that history and all mankind depends upon is that God will provide the sacrifice. Right, exactly. Um, so uh, let me see. They, this verse here, he says, uh, For because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son. So you see, Isaac, uh, Abraham and Isaac is a picture of father and son. Father, I, Abraham would be, be representing God the Father. Isaac would be representing Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And just as Abraham did not withhold his son, God, the Father, will not withhold His Son, Jesus Christ. His, and it says, "Thine only Son." Right. So exactly. The uh, the parallel here is uh, not accidental. Right. Exactly. You're on. Yeah. You're right on. Uh, okay. Then he goes on and says, as we read down, "Thy seed." In verse eighteen, he says, "In thy seed shall all nations, all the nations of the earth, be blessed." Now, I've heard this explained that it's, it's really, really significant that in verse 18, it says seed singular rather than seeds plural. Because right. the, seeds, the seeds of Abraham are all the descendants, the entire population of people who come from uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all these, this family tree that grows to be millions and millions of people as his descendants. It doesn't say seeds. It says, and thy, in thy seed 
shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And this, this, because it's singular, we think, well, what is the singular seed that blesses the earth? Well, that's the seed that comes from, eventually, his, the family line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jesse, Judah, uh, David, and then uh, eventually we get Jesus for, as a seed, the seed that saves and blesses the whole earth, because through Jesus, the whole earth is blessed. Everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord gets saved. Right. I mean, you know, when when he said, in thy seed, who was thy seed? Thy seed meaning Isaac. Isaac, all nations of earth be blessed. And uh, ever since uh, Isaac, <laughs> wow, he was blessed with 12 sons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, Jacob was blessed with 12 sons. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, you got Abraham, you had Isaac and Ishmael, oh, and then Isaac. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jacob and Esau, and then uh, Jacob oh, yeah. Israel. Yeah. Right, right. Time. Okay, so verse 19. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, uh, she hath also bore children unto thy brother Nahor, uh, okay, the rest of it is not really relevant to anything. Uh, I okay. guess we can go on to uh, back to these occurrences of Abraham's name now. But chapter 22 is important to be covered completely on its own. Uh, so now we go into uh, uh, chapter 23. Uh, it says, and Sarah died in Kurj, Kurj Atharba. That's uh, 23, verse 2. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to the mount for Sarah and to weep for her. Uh, could you imagine? I mean, uh, I, there, there's a, there's a brother on YouTube that uh, that we all know and love, uh, and and his 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 wife is very ill with cancer, and and, and, and I'm praying for them every day, and I'm hoping that uh, that God will will spare them and restore her health, and I, I hope that if you're watching now, let's, let's pray for this this saint. Uh, and his wife for her recovery. I won't mention the name because God knows the name. But uh, the idea of losing your your spouse. Uh, I know that this brother loves his wife so much. I mean, up there, I, there's probably nobody I've ever known that loves their wife more than he loves his wife. And uh, uh, the idea of losing your wife that you love dearly is such a tragic thing. And I, I'm imagining how. This is happening here with, with Abraham and losing Sarah after everything that they've gone through. It's living such an old age together. And that uh, it just it must be devastating. Are you in com are you in communication with him still? I know he closed his channel and stuff, but uh, I uh, I called him and, and left a message on his phone uh, and just to let him know I'm Continuing to pray for them, and that uh, he he can call me whenever he feels like it. But you know, sometimes the best thing is people. Is, it's hard for them to talk about things, and it's best to not. And they just need they just need their time together. Right. Yeah. So, but he, you know, he has my phone number, and I I I am hoping that someday that we'll talk again. Right. But uh, yeah, this is a. Sad, sad thing. I mean, I, I I love my wife so much, and if if I, I lost her, and I haven't been married near as long as Sarah and Abraham have been married, but uh, I can imagine how Abraham is feeling. He says, uh, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Yeah. Uh, and Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, 
that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, that thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury the, thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee this his sepulcher, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me for to Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, uh, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it to me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. Um, the interesting thing here that uh, I want to look at is uh, that he, he uh, insists on paying for this land, uh, this, this parcel, uh, rather than accepting it as a gift. Mm -hmm. Never, uh, Ephraim answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury there for thy dead. Uh, uh, and Abraham weighed to Ephraim the silver. But I, I'm wondering, why what, what do you think he uh, insisted on paying for it when uh, they were willing to uh, give him this? this I, see, I see it two points. First of all, Abraham... As he haggled with God, we can see he is, he is quite a businessman. And secondly, as a businessman, he knows how to handle things properly. Because without any sort of contract or without any sort of, if it's going to be verbal, you never know uh, what will happen to any sort of promise. It doesn't matter at this point that they would be saying, Oh, you know, you can use our land for free. I mean, they, they, they have really good intentions, of course. But we never know later on, even when Abraham is passed, uh, you know, their descendants might have some kind of uh, struggle or trouble. So all their, all their promises um, may be forfeited somehow. So he's, I think he's making a point here uh, that I want this properly done. And I want uh, this grave and mine, of course, later, that to be secured even in the future. So, so later on, uh, you know, they don't have the descendants won't have any excuse. Oh, you know, you, you he didn't even pay for it. You know, so we can do whatever we want to do with their graves. You know what I'm saying? So he wanted to make it clear and and precise. You know that surely none of those terrible things will happen. Uh, later in the future. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it's interesting that uh, even in a time of such uh, extreme grief, that he was able to think clearly enough to, to realize what you said, that, uh, yeah, he could accept it as a gift and he could save some money, but uh, what happens in the future if he had, doesn't have a, a legal claim on, on it? And, so uh, it was it was wise, and he he was able to be a clear thinking even at a time when he was so heartbroken. Yep. All right, let's uh, let's move on to uh, now to uh, we're in chapter twenty four, uh, verse one. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abram said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had put was his name p-o-t <laughs> i pray thee uh thy hand under my thigh hmm. uh, oh no i guess put is is not his name that's what he wants him to do let me go look at this in context because i <laughs> that was funny i thought that was can be a little weird <laughs> <laughs> Abraham said this eldest servant of his house ruled over that he had put <laughs> I pray thee <laughs> thy hand under my thigh 
and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife until my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Uh, <laughs> it just shows you how, uh, you know, you can read something and it, depending upon where the commas are and how you uh, emphasize the word, it can be totally something totally different. But it is capitalized. I wonder why they capitalized it in this uh, KJV. Do you notice that? Yeah, I think they, uh, they're they missing this, uh, uh, what do you call it, quotes? Like, you know, quoting, you know, is quoting something. Right? Yeah. And then a comma, and then, and then, and, and then quote. You got to put quote there, you know, and close quote. So, you know, just the quotes are missing there. Uh, I don't think they have that, that quote. So they are putting that in, in, in a capital letter, letter I guess. Mm -hmm. And that's not his name, obviously. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, <laughs> uh, and, but thou, thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And uh, the servant said unto him, Prayer venture, the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. Uh, I'm gonna have to look at this in the uh, amplified to make more sense out of it. But uh, what I'm curious about here is uh, putting uh, uh, thy hand under my thigh. I, what is the significance? Is that some kind of a, a like a handshake agreement where you're taking an oath or something? Uh, that is I guess it's, just like it's done during the old times. Um, you know, like this was something to do with thigh and when, um, when even Isaac was uh, blessing Jacob, thinking that it was Esau. Um, um, he did a similar thing here. Uh, you know, in order to put any, in order to put your hand underneath the thigh, you have to lower yourself, I guess, and you have to be close, and you have to, and it's some kind of very discreet here. You know, some, you're sharing something quite secretive and discreet uh, to someone who's very close. So I think that's that's still maybe the gesture uh, that they have done. Um, so that that would be my guess. Yeah, it just, uh, it seems very strange, uh, uh, I beg of you, and I can see people shaking hands or doing something else, but put your hand under my thigh, if I'm understanding the actual, what that means, uh, I would feel very uncomfortable asking some, anybody uh, to put their hand under my thigh. That's, uh, and that just strikes me as weird. But, uh, there's a lot of customs around the world that are uh, strange to me, I guess. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, it's probably done um, some with um, if you want to make certain promises or uh, very some very important uh, promises or discreet. Um, that's 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 how it, I, I would see it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to read this in Amplified, starting with verse 3. It says, And you shall swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I have settled. But you shall go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. Right. Yeah, he's uh, insisting that this person, his servant, promise that he will help uh, make sure that Isaac does not marry a Canaanite, a foreigner, but, but marry someone from his own family. Because, uh, you know, he married his sister, Sarah. Uh, somehow, I don't know, I don't remember how he explained it, but he married her and somehow she was a sister too, like maybe a half-sister, like a, uh, uh, they didn't have the same mother and father, but they had the same father, not mother. You know, or something like that. But I guess it's just very common now. They were still marrying fairly close relatives. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you know, 
for sure, Abraham uh, didn't like so much of the of the Canaanites. <laughs> you know, he surely didn't want his son to to be marrying these uh, Canaanites and stuff. So maybe um, maybe his other children, other son. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the Canaanites, I'm not really sure, but I believe the Canaanites were a darker race uh, and that they, uh, uh, maybe like Africans today, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, because I know that they say that the descendants of Canaan, uh, the, the darker races came from his descendants, and then the Asian races came from Shem, and the Caucasian races came from uh, Japheth. The three sons of Noah. I've heard that taught. I'm I'm not sure how much uh, I, I can, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I doubt that. You know, even Abraham um, wasn't so light skinned anyway. <laughs> yeah. To begin with. Yeah, but his so. it is it does seem important that he doesn't want uh, them to uh, his son to be marrying in, from the Canaanites, and right. I don't because think Canaanites. The Canaanites they were disobedient to God, so obviously yeah. you didn't want anyone marrying them. Yeah, I, I think you're right that it's it's not it doesn't have to do with a racial thing; it has to do with a uh, right. spiritual thing. He wanted someone uh, to make sure that he wasn't led astray uh, and got into a, a community, married into a community where they're maybe going to be lead them into worshiping, you know, false gods and things like that. Right. Exactly. Okay, so uh, the servant said, okay, but perhaps the woman will not be willing to come along after me to this country. Must I take your son to the country from which you came? Abraham said to him, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house, from the land of my family and my birth, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife from there for my son. Mm -hmm. So he took the oath, and then the servant goes off under the thigh. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. I still can't get over this custom of putting your I hand. Think, yeah, I think that's what they've done to swear something, you know, to, to make a promise. Um to show that you are sincere about the promise, um, yeah, you know, yeah, I would think that it would probably be done from the outer part of the thigh rather than the inner part of the thigh where you're, you're, uh, you're no, I, don't think so. I would think that Abraham is either sitting down or lying down if he's ill, uh, but I'm sure he's kind of relaxing, sitting down, and he has his servant next to him, his eldest servant, who can whom he can trust. He's been trusting him for like what with his business and life all throughout. I'm sure, you know, each other they have saved their lives together. Um, so, you know, it's not two hands. I don't think he's the servant is putting his hand singular his hand whether that's left or right I don't know uh, under the thigh. So he, if his is Abraham is sitting down, it's basically you, you put your hand under your thigh, like just below your. Uh, just below, I guess, um, not in, not inner thigh, where the crotch is, <laughs> but under. So, like, imagine there's someone sitting next to you, and he's putting a hand under your thigh, right? Like around your buttocks, buttocks area, or around your um, the under your knee, or whatever. But it's certainly not not inner thigh. <laughs> there's <Yeah>. no. <laughs> That does. That does not seem right to me either. Uh, but, but I do. I do think the idea that you introduced about trust may be part of this uh, custom, uh, because you certainly want to feel like, uh, hey, this is a sign of trust. Put your hand under my thigh. I'm showing you. I'm trusting you. Uh, you know, and uh, maybe that's a gesture of that. Hey, I trust you. I'll let you put your hand under my thigh. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd like to know more about that. If anybody understands that custom better, please make a comment on it on this. Uh, okay, and the servant. So now 
it gets on and uh, I'm moving up to verse uh, 12 and he said oh Lord God of my master Abraham I pray you cause me to meet with good success today and show kindness to my master Abraham um, so the rest of this is getting uh, more just talking referencing Abraham as far as this servant going on the journey to find a son for uh, uh, I mean a wife for uh, Isaac uh, let me see if we can find something that's relevant to Abraham's will okay so Genesis 24 Uh, this the rest of this chapter is all about this adventure to get a wife. Uh, I think that we get to here now to uh, uh, Genesis twenty five. Let's start with twenty five one. And in Genesis twenty five one it says, "Then again Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah." Now, that strikes me as very strange because we know that he was a hundred years old when his wife had had, uh, had um, Isaac. Now Isaac's grown, and so he must be like 120, and then he's taking a wife, another wife, at the age of 120. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Jeez. <a> strong man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right let me look at this chapter here chapter 25 <laughs> oh. Oh, man. She, and and she bare him it took a wife her name was Keturah and she bare him Zimron Jock Shan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua and Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim and Letushim and Lemim, Le Le and the sons of, wow, this goes on and on. And Abraham gave all that he had to unto Isaac, but unto the concubines, the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and uh, sent them away from Isaac his son. And these are the days of the years of Abraham, which he lived a hundred threescore and fifteen years. A hundred threescore and fifteen years. How old is that? One seventy-five. Yeah, a hundred and seventy-five. So even at this time in history, people's lifespans were uh, were uh, so much greater than they are today. Not as long as as uh, before the flood. Where they were living seven, eight, nine hundred years, but still, right. this is 175 years, and he's a hundred years old and has all these concubines and all these, um, you know, uh, other children. Amazing. You sound, you sound, you sound kind of envious. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I'm not envious. I'm just like in awe, in awe of this. Abraham was, Abraham was a strong man, in and out. Yeah. <laughs> this, this virility, well up into the, the second century. <laughs> man. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, we're at the close here. I think the next thing that happens here is... Uh, uh, right, it's about generation. Yeah. And, and it came to pass after the... Uh, let me see. And verse 8 says, Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Okay. Um, I think there's uh, there may be some references to Abraham in the New Testament, but um, these are not really, um, they would not be the uh, occurrences of his life. These are looking back at his life in the New Testament. Let me see what we got coming up here. We look going to his grave and uh, 
references, people looking back and discussing and mentioning Abraham and his promises. Yeah, he's all, his name still appears all through, you know, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. They're still referencing his name. But of course, the events of his life are over now. And the only thing they can do now is, is look back and discuss Abraham, this great man of faith. And we even get uh, in the New Testament, Matthew, uh, Luke, uh, and we know that uh, John, and Acts, and even in, uh, in Romans, he cited, and then I guess Hebrews would probably, might be the last time I'm guessing as I'm scrolling through Galatians, um, Hebrews. I'm thinking Hebrews. Yeah, Hebrews is the last one. So I, I don't think there's any reason for us to go to these other New Testament scriptures that mention him and, and cite him, talk about it, because we've all what we've done is we've already gone through his his life's events. And what I wanted to do was look at the events of his life and see what we can learn about this, this great character uh, in the scriptures. And uh, why don't we take just a moment here to kind of sum up very, very briefly what you think of Abraham his entire life. And, 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 and uh, I'll do the same, and, and then we'll close the discussion on this and uh, 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 do a, an invitation for salvation before we, we quit. But you sum up your whole thoughts about Abraham. Well, my thoughts on him um, has been the same. Um, and still, even after the study, uh, it just reinforced how, how faithful he was, how obedient he was to God. And to the point that, you know, he would actually carry out um, you know what God God told him, including um, you know, like about to sacrifice his son and and so forth. Uh, we went through that. You know when we have that sort of experiences and when we have that sort of um, interactions, when we walk with God, when we know Him. Um, our faith uh, will be that strong um, because because of the covenant, because of the the very promise that God had made with Abraham. You know, Abraham was sure that he was being tempted, and this and despite despite it all, uh, we have clearly observed his faith. Now, in order for us to keep that sort of faith or even close to that, we have to walk with God. We have to know God. Uh, we have to know what God is talking about or, or speaking through us. In order to do that, we have to know Christ. We have to believe on Christ, obviously, and trust on him. Even Christ himself said that, you know, if you want to know God or see God, you you got to know Christ because knowing Christ is knowing God. So as we uh, have faith in Christ and we'll get to know God more and more every day and maybe to the point that we'll have, you know, the faith of Abraham. Um, so basically, um, right now for us, we don't have to sacrifice anyone. All we have to do is, you know, keep the word close because the word of God is where our faith is coming from. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And we know and understand that our faith is not the same. It, it is given by God, but in different measures. So our walk uh, can be a little different and um, I think we as we walk our faith and as we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling uh, 
I think that we will grow in faith and thereby becoming perfect in Christ. And that's how I feel about and felt about Abraham. And that's one of the things that I strive for, to have more faith, stronger faith, by knowing Christ and knowing God. Thank you. God bless you. All right. Uh, well, I want to try to very briefly sum up my uh, what I believe about and, and learned about Abraham. Um, this is a I, I've done well over 400 videos on YouTube, and uh, some of the videos are like this. They're two hours long. Many uh, over 100 or two hours long, and, and many of them are five, 10, 20 minutes, but. But for most of the time on YouTube, I've been doing what's called topical studies, where we take a subject and discuss it. And now we've been doing these character studies where we're studying the life of a person, of a, of a very significant person. And the, the first character study was Adam and Eve. And then we did a character study of Satan. And then Noah. And now we just did, completed the study on Abraham. Uh, the, these studies are all available on my YouTube channel. We can learn a lot by studying the lives of these great characters in the scriptures. Regarding Abraham, uh, he is definitely one of the most admired uh, people in the Bible. And we see, we see that he was certainly a flawed man because all men are flawed. Every character, no matter how wonderful we think he was, uh, you know, Abraham lied. And he, and he demonstrated a lack of faith from time to time. But in the end, he demonstrated the great faith that he was willing to even sacrifice his son, uh, if need be. And, uh, uh, but all the characters of the Bible are flawed, except our Savior, Jesus. Uh, and that's why even Abraham, he had to have God save him. And, and, and we, I mentioned all the books in the Bible that mention him. Now, he's... He's, de he's deceased at this point, at the end of the study, Abraham is deceased, where he can no longer study his life, but I went on and on and on talking about Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and all these different Bibles, and then a way into the New Testament, all the way up to Hebrews, they're still talking about Abraham. That's how significant he is. Uh, and yet Paul talks about Abraham and said that he was justified by his faith. Yeah, so... He, Abraham was saved because he believed God. And uh, he, when he first believed God, that's when he got saved. And God promised him all these things. Uh, and he, God kept his promise to Abraham. And then he ended up demonstrating this ultimate demonstration of his faith when he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. Um, so it's, uh, he's a fascinating character. He's a very admirable character in many ways, and yet he's flawed just as I am and Sam and the rest of us. We, we all have our, uh, our flaws and our weaknesses, uh, and yet uh, as Abraham had faith, Sam and I have faith, and I, I, we hope that you will have faith. If you have not put your faith in Jesus, we're hoping you'll do it right now. I'm going to ask Brother Sam just to, take a moment here and just tell anybody who's going to watch the video, um, what does it mean to put your faith in Jesus? And why, why should someone put their faith in Jesus? Brother Sam? Well, to me, uh, putting faith in Christ means uh, believing and trusting on what he said and done for us completely. Uh, what he said, what he has done for us being on the cross for our sin and being resurrected. All the things that he said, completely. Not, in, not just in a sense of existence, not artificially believing, but truly putting all your trust on Christ. Uh, why we do that is because, um, just like what Christ said, that, you know, whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life and that is actually participating in the will of God as in John 6 said uh, the will of God is to believe on Jesus Christ so that we can be risen up 
And um, hey, I like life. <laughs> no matter what sort of uh, you know good or bad things that could offer, and I would like to continue my life, um, even if that means eternally. So you know, I mean, how can I say? How can any other religion offer such thing other than uh, other than Christianity or Christianity, for, uh, as we put it? But you know, that's one of the reasons that uh, that we believe on Christ, and that's what it means by believing on Christ. And if if someone doesn't want to believe, I guess that's their prerogative. But Christ did die for all. It is now up to us uh, to make that choice, to, to completely believe on him um, so that we can have everlasting life. And I hope that uh, if you are not a believer, um, it doesn't matter how much you, you, you possess some sort of evidence, whether you are a believer or not, those kind of things will not save anyone. Only by believing on Christ can one be saved. You know, we see a lot of uh, debates, so, so called, uh, they call it great uh, debate um, community or, or what, have, what have you. No, no amount of, of debate will save anyone. No, no priest, no other people who, you know, who would claim that they have evidence of God. Uh, will 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 not say will save anyone. So you know, bottom line is no matter what we do. In other words, no matter what sort of the work of man is there out there that you might agree or disagree with, that will not save you. What will save you is by believing on. Jesus Christ and and walking the faith in Christ. Now, there are two things, of course, that we ought to do after we are saved. But in order for us to be saved, saved as as you know, simply put, believe on Jesus Christ. And as 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 in John one twelve says, once you believe on Him. You are given with the power to become sons of God. And guess what? Just like how you would be a son of your father, and, and no matter what you do, you will still be a son of your father. Once you become a son of God, you will always be a son of God. After you are, after you are saved, after you become uh, a son of God, you know, just like in James, we ought to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not like, hey, because of this person, I'm not going to believe. It's not, it's not like, hey, because of this person or that person or that person is not Christ, is not Christ-like or, or that sort of uh, behavior is, is unchristian. That sort of fruit inspection um, is quite futile and, and vain. Nothing but all those things are um, vanity and vexation of spirit. Um, so it's just between you and God. So there's no excuse. There's nobody you can blame. So make your choice today. It's your life. I made mine. So I'm, I'm quite happy and blessed in so many ways. And as we have gone through the study and, what, and the faith of Abraham, I think that's what we should strive for in life as well. And, um, and that's how we can grow perfect in Christ. Simply put, believe on Christ and leave. Thank you, and God bless you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, 
so I know that some of the people who are watching these videos here, you're you're already a Christian. A Christian, what I define as Christianity, is a person who relies on Christ for their salvation. I'm not trying to get to heaven by being a religious person, by by striving and hoping that if I'm good enough, God will accept me. No, I'm not trying to do it any other way except I rely on Christ. That's what we're just asking you to do. Rely on Christ for your salvation. Depend on him. Put your faith on him completely, and he will give you eternal life in, the, in heaven forever and ever. It's that simple. You know, I hope you don't wait to get every theological question resolved and, and get every all the evidence and proofs in place. Uh, that can all come later. Uh, when I when I first believed on Jesus, I just started reading the Bible and and I and I believed and I got saved. And all the other answers to me came later, as far as the the the, the, the proofs, the evidence that the Bible's true and Jesus is God and He did die for my sins. I mean, I have the evidence and proof that I've acquired over the years. But for now, just have faith. Just trust Jesus and receive life everlasting. Brother Sam, thank you for uh, joining me today. I really enjoyed uh, talking about chapter 22 with you today. And uh, so I, um, uh, next week, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue with character studies on uh, Sunday right now. I think I'm, I'm going to consider possibly doing that study that we had discussed on the uh, the term angel of the Lord in Christophanes. I might go off into that for a few Sundays until we get that settled and then come back to character studies. The next character I'm sure would be Isaac, the son that we just discussed, that Abraham's son Isaac. But uh, for now, uh, this is over and uh, thank you for joining me, um, brother and everybody watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.